Vanakam Dohadeva and everyone. <clears throat> Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavai Dejasvinavadi Tamastu Ma Bidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Thank you for all the beautiful Murugan songs putting us in the mood for Taipusam for those places that will be celebrated. <laughs> We're having our celebration here um, day after tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Our Abhishekam begins and should be live streamed. And we've had some requests for past live streaming to do more during when the curtain is closed because it gets silent for half an hour. That's because no one's in the temple. <laughs> For our festivals, we don't have anyone attending except the monks, and they're not in the temple at that particular moment. So that's why there's not any singing while the deity's being dressed, because no one's present, unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions on occupancy and masks and all. Okay, so we'll share the screen. And first topic. Here we go. First topic. Close that one. And this topic is a bit related to what we were doing for the last four or five satsangs, which is talking about Hinduism from different points of view. This is comparing Hinduism to other religions. Sinner or divinity. While some faiths view man as sinful by nature, Hinduism holds that our inmost self is the divine and taintless soul, or Atma. This is from 2012, Publisher's Desk. His publisher's desk was written based upon traveling in Trinidad back before 2012, a long time ago. The story itself is at the beginning of the publisher's desk text, so I won't tell the story. And it shows an important way in which Hinduism and Christianity differ. So this relates to the idea, aren't all religions the same? That's a famous Hindu statement that's incorrect. If Swami Chinmayananda got a hold of that one, he'd really have fun. So, of course, all religions aren't the same. And what Hindus really mean when they say that is all religions are good that everybody's fine in the religion they're in. There's no need for everybody in the world to become a Hindu. But they're not all the same. And this is an important difference. Divinity versus sinner. In today's world of global communication, we encounter a multiplicity of views about the nature of man on a regular basis. At one extreme, each human being is inherently weak, imperfect, sinful, and without divine redemption, will remain helplessly so. The other extreme, each human is inherently divine. It is instinctive nature, the animal-like nature, which contains the tendencies to become angry and harm others. Therefore, part of making progress on the spiritual path is learning to control the instinctive nature. This is one of the themes I talked about with Hindus in the Caribbean in August of 2011 told in Trinidad during my 2010 trip that this message, you are a sinner in need of redemption, is being promoted strongly in an effort to convert Hindus. 
there was a big Christian effort back then to convert the Hindus in Trinidad on a large scale to Christianity. I am often asked, what should we say when confronted with this argument by strong-willed evangelists? What is the Hindu view? You're a sinner and you need to be redeemed to be saved. That's the question. So what do you think would be a good answer to uh, you are a sinner and you need to be redeemed? Let's explore three quotations from prominent swamis to define our perspective. First is Swami Vivekananda's address to the world's parliament of religions, which was held in Chicago in 1893. Vivekananda's message reflects his typically outspoken manner in affirming truth as he saw it. Being and becoming are different aspects of the same reality and are only relative to our intelligence. Man has the promise and potentiality of divine realization of spiritual perfection and therefore is God in the making for even as humanity is intelligible only if regarded as an individualized self-expression of God. It is derogatory to human nature therefore to attribute sin to man. Besides God being the sole and supreme reality, how could a foreign element like sin invade the sanctuary of being? The Hindus refuse to call you sinners, ye divinities on earth, sinners. It is a sin to call man so. It is a standing libel on human nature. Nicely outspoken, Swamiji. Chinmayanandaji echoes those thoughts. Man is essentially divine, but the divinity in him is veiled by the unbroken series of desires and thoughts arising in his bosom. A variety of these grades and concentration of these create the variety of human beings. To remove the encrustation of desires and thoughts and unfold the divinity inherent in man is the ultimate goal envisaged by the scriptures. So oh, that's a helpful image there that we have something that's covered over, incrustation. It's like something from the ocean that has a lot of incrustation on it, various kinds of growth, plant growth, sea animal growth, and you can clean it off and then you have the object itself. So in this case, our divinity has the incrustation of desires and thoughts. So worldly desires and worldly thoughts. Doesn't mean divine desires and divine thoughts, but ordinary worldly desires and thoughts, they cover it. And they cover it in a way that it takes some work to get them off, just like you were cleaning something from the ocean, in crustacean. Gurudeva gave a succinct description of our divine nature. Deep inside, we are perfect this very moment, and we have only to discover and live up to this perfection to be whole. We have taken birth in a physical body to grow and evolve into our divine potential. We are inwardly already one with God. So we don't have to do anything to become one with God. We just have to find that part of us, uncover that part of us that is already one with God. Our religion contains the knowledge of how to realize this oneness and not created unwanted experiences along the way. Three very beautiful quotes, different in their images, but the same in their core idea. Man is already a divine being. He just has to find that part of him that's divine, which is what the religion provides, is that knowledge of how to realize this oneness or how to remove the incrustation of desires and thoughts. These opposite perspectives on man's nature, sinner and divinity, were candidly juxtaposed during a 2012 
interfaith panel discussion in Midland, Texas, in which I represented Hinduism. The issue arose as clergy from five faiths responded to the question, in your faith, is humanity considered a one family? My answer was the Hindu belief that gives rise to tolerance of differences in race and nationality is that all of mankind is good. We are all divine beings, souls created by God. Hindus do not accept the concept that some individuals are evil and others are good. Hindus believe that each, is an, each individual is a soul, a divine being, who is inherently good. Scriptures tell us that each soul is emanated from God as a spark from a fire, beginning a spiritual journey which eventually leads back to God. All human beings are on this journey, whether they realize it or not. Very nice statement from Guru Deva there. Even those who are not consciously on the journey, who would deny they're on the journey, returning to God, are actually on the journey. The next speaker, Dr. Randall Everett of the Baptist Christian faith, put forth a distinctly different perspective. The idea of the oneness of humanity, this is where Christianity would differ from some of the religions. We do believe in the oneness of humanity, but the oneness of humanity is that we are a fallen people. We do not believe that we are inherently good. We believe we are inherently selfish and self-centered. And that's why we need to be rescued or redeemed, that Christ rescues us from the domain of darkness. Whoa, if you're not familiar with that, <laughs> that's very different than the Hindu point of view. We need to be rescued from the domain of darkness. So let's see what we're saying here. Having in mind what has been presented so far, how would you respond to the statement, you are a sinner in need of redemption? Oh, the question is not on the screen there. So one answer would be that we need to learn to harness our desires and thoughts. We need greater self-control. That we're not really a sinner, we're just not manifesting sufficient self-control to harness our desires and thoughts. So oh, looking more closely at the Hindu belief that man is not inherently sinful, rather the essence of man is divine and perfect. Or the question arises, what is the Hindu view of sin? Gurudeva responds in Dancing with Shiva. Instead of seeing good and evil in the world, we understand the nature of the embodied soul in three interrelated parts. Instinctive or physical, emotional, intellectual or mental, and superconscious or spiritual. So three parts to the human being. So that's another answer to the question we just asked about being sinful, that the Hindu view is man's nature is threefold, instinctive, intellectual, and superconscious. So in other words, what this isn't actually saying and implying is if someone was only instinctive, then you could call him a sinner. If that was, if we only had one aspect to our nature, instinctive, which is just being like an animal, you know, that deserves to be called a sinner. Um, but we have an intellectual nature and a superconscious or intuitive nature as well. 
So to say we're a sinner is really missing the point. If someone's a sinner, it just means their instinctive nature is strong and they have yet to develop their intellectual and superconscious nature. If someone is a great saint, it means their superconscious nature is strong and they've got their intellectual and instinctive nature under control. So different people are simply a manifestation of these, these three natures combined in different ways. When the outer or lower instinctive nature dominates, one is prone to anger, fear, greed, jealousy, hatred, and backbiting. When the intellect is prominent, arrogance and analytical thinking preside. When the superconscious soul comes forth, the refined qualities are born, compassion, insight, modesty, and the other qualities. The animal instincts of the young soul are strong. The intellect yet to be developed is non-existent to control these strong instinctive impulses. When the intellect is developed, the instinctive nature subsides. So you can see it, the instinctive is controlled by the intellectual. And then the next point. When the soul unfolds and overshadows the well-developed intellect, the mental harness is loosened and removed. So the superconscious controls the intellect. So first we need to develop an intellect to control the instinctive. Then we need to develop the superconscious mind to control the intellect. In the quote on sin, Gurudeva made reference to the concept of young soul. The idea is that all souls were created by God, but not at the same time. Thus, some are young souls at the beginning of the spiritual path, symbolized by the cowrie tree seedling, while others are old souls near the end, symbolized by the 2,000-year-old mature cowrie tree. This one really grows to get quite old. 2,000-year-old tree. Amazing. Yoga Swami, in speaking to his devotees, described life as a school, with some in the MA class and others in kindergarten. If kindergarten isn't a terminology, it means preschool, four-year-olds. <clears throat> Knowing the differences in spiritual maturity, he gave to each accordingly. So he didn't criticize those in kindergarten. He just gave them what was appropriate to their level. Likewise, he didn't overly praise those who were in the MA class. You'd make them too proud. He gave them what was appropriate. So he just responds to people, responded to people where they were on the path. He induced to not condemn some men as evil and extol others as good. but rather see all as divine beings, some young, some old, and some in the intermediary stages. Back to our subject of man's nature. This understanding of man's threefold nature, instinctive, intellectual, and spiritual, explains why people act in ways that are clearly not divine, such as becoming angry and harming others. There is more to man than his essence or inner nature. We also have an outer nature Here comes. Each of us is a soul, a divine being, living in a physical body. At the deepest level, we are a pure, radiant, blissful soul. That is our spiritual or intuitive nature. And of course, it's covered up by an intellectual and an instinctive nature. What other description did Gurudeva give to our threefold nature that relates it to the mind? How does that threefold nature relate to the mind? <clears throat> Gurudeva referred to man's instinctive, intellectual, and intuitive natures as the three phases of the mind. <clears throat> so in Gurudeva's teachings, we have phases of the mind 
and states of mind. So there's a difference. <clears throat> so phases of the mind is explained in the next slide. By the word phases, Gurudeva means how the mind functions. The major categories of activities that it performs. Let's look in more detail at each of these three phases of the mind. Distinctive mind is easy to become aware of an experience that includes the impulses of our physical body, our cravings, our desires, our digestive system, and our emotional mechanism that works through the physical body. The systems of elimination and blood circulation and the regulation of the heartbeat are all within the instinctive mind. This phase of mind functions automatically or instinctively. It is as much alive in the animal kingdom as among humans. So fortunately, for example, we don't have to consciously digest what we eat. That will be quite a process, very time consuming, but we eat something and the body automatically knows how to digest it. So it's automatic, it's a function of the instinctive mind. In a religious context, instinctive and instinctiveness are used to describe the lower animal instincts of human nature, such as self-preservation, procreation, hunger, and thirst, as well as lower emotions of humans, such as greed, hatred, anger, fear, lust, and jealousy. Sanskrit term for the instinctive mind is manaschitta. Okay, I just did this one. This says we can combine all the many things in an Indian meal and somehow we know how to digest them. It goes on by itself. So that's the instinctive mind. Typical meal there. Studying the behavior of animals is a good way to understand the instinctive mind. Take cats as an example. A cat can be curled up and quite content. Then there's a loud noise. The cat has no choice but to become fearful and scowl. They may run and hide. Cats have absolutely no choice. Cats can't think. I wonder what that noise is. Should I run away? Am I being threatened? They don't have that choice. It's an automatic response to a stimulus. Let's compare the cat to a dog. If the dog hears the same noise that the cat did, his response is to start barking at the noise. He doesn't run and hide. His instinctive mind has a different set of responses than does that of a cat. What insights did you gain into man's instinctive nature from the previous slides? Man alone develops the intellectual mind, meaning animals don't, and is responsible for his composition as he lives along through life. This phase is a mixture of man's instinctive desires and cravings coupled with the knowledge he has gained from others and from his own intuitive discoveries. Within man's intellect, he organizes a vast amount of knowledge that begins to accumulate from a very early age. 90% of this knowledge deals with the externality of the world and mind itself. The intellect can consume most of man's time through an incarnation and usually does, lifetime after lifetime. We're constantly wrapped up in current events, current, current politics, economics, social issues, consume a lot of our thought process. Sanskrit term for the intellectual mind is Buddhi chitta. School is an example of utilizing the intellectual mind. When we are younger, schooling consists of memorizing important information. We are first focused on developing the intellectual ability of memory. When we are older, we learn to use the faculty of reason and logic to analyze information. It is no longer enough simply to recall the facts from memory. We need to learn to analyze them according to reason and logic and come to certain conclusions. Memory, reason, and logic are all part of the intellectual mind. So we start when we're young, all we can do is memorize. 
schooling, the tests in school, they're just memorization. And then when we get older, we use the faculty of reason and logic to analyze. But we can't do that till a certain age. The intellect just isn't mature enough. What insights did you gain into man's intellectual nature? The intuitive or superconscious phase is even more complex, more organized, more refined than the instinctive or intellectual phases. When intuitive flashes come, one knows the next thing to be done in a creative activity. It is mystically known as the mind of light, for when one is in the state of mind, he may see light within his head, and sometimes throughout the entirety of his physical body, if his inner sight is developed enough. Otherwise, he just begins to feel good all over, as actinic energy permeates his nervous system. Its most refined essence is Satchit Ananda, all-knowing, omnipresent consciousness, the one transcendental, self-luminous divine mind common to all souls. Sanskrit term for the intuitive mind is Karana Chitta. Example of an intuitive flash is if you have ever had a hunch and had it work out. That is a superconscious mind murking within you. It has dominated your intellectual mind that has made it possible for you to look into the future and estimate its happenings. Second example is that in addition to seeing a brilliant inner light, other profound experiences occur in meditation, such as an intense divine love for everyone and everything. We can live more in our intuitive nature through consistent meditation and devotional activities in the home shrine, chanting, performing puja, attending puja and going to the temple on a regular basis. Listening to and playing refined music and performing traditional dance and other creative arts are also ways of channeling the energies into the intuitive nature. What insights did you gain into man's intuitive nature? <clears throat> I like to say we have an inner perfection and an outer perfection. We can take heart in identifying more with the inner perfection, our soul nature, and realize the outer has its problems, which we can work on. That is the purpose of our life on earth, to work on ourselves, to learn, evolve, and ultimately know God. With this attitude born of the belief in our divinity, we are more detached from our shortcomings and difficulties. This is very important. Sometimes individuals only identify with their outer nature and the shortcomings and difficulties of it are the part they identify with the most. So that's a very limiting and can be a very unhappy state of mind. Whereas if we can shift it to identify with the soul nature, which is divine and perfect, and then our outer nature, we do the best we can. You know, it always has shortcomings. Not that we make excuses, but we're not that uh, disappointed in ourselves when we find mistakes are made. We know it's just our outer nature and we're continually trying to refine it, get it more under control. But the inner one is perfect all the time. The inner nature is just energy flowing through our outer instinctive and intellectual nature. It is not who we are. We realize that we can control that energy flow. How do I want my energy to flow? Which negative habit do I want to improve today? It all becomes easier to tackle because we look at it in an impersonal way. Nice point. The concept of man's threefold nature can help us put our failings into perspective so that we do not become discouraged by them, just what I said. Shortcomings such as occasionally being hurtful toward others do not at all change the fact that our essence is divine. We can deepen our experience of inner divinity and overcome shortcomings by consistently following the various practices in the Hindu religion. 
When we feel good about ourselves, we can more readily identify negative patterns and change them. If we have a negative concept of ourselves, believing that we are inherently flawed and sinful, we are not in such a good position to advance on the spiritual path. And one thing we can all feel good about is that Hinduism assures us not only that we are not sinners, but that every human being without exception is destined to achieve spiritual enlightenment and liberation. So that's a pretty good promise. As I jokingly said in one of the satsangs, you know, if religion says you're either going to go to heaven or hell, which certain religions say, Hinduism says, well, eventually you're going to end up in, everyone's going to end up in heaven, which religion would you choose? <laughs> it's guaranteed in Hinduism if you stick it out. So, second topic, appropriate here, got the Kavadi, Jai Murugan, where it says youth reflect on Hinduism. And we have some facts. Please excuse my pronunciation. French and English are not similar. A few more facts about Mauritius Ganga Talao, commonly known as Grand Bassam, is a crater like situated in a secluded mountain area in the district of Savan, deep in the heart of Mauritius. It is about 550 meters, 1800 feet above sea level. The first group of pilgrims who went to Ganga Talao were from the village of Triolet, and it was led by Pandit Giri Gosan from Terouge in 1898. That's a long time ago. It's considered the most sacred Hindu place in Mauritius and, of course, comes to life at Mahashivaratri in particular. Shiv Mandir, a picture here, is located on the bank of the lake and is dedicated to Lord Shiva. There are temples dedicated to other gods, including Lord Hanuman, Goddess Ganga, Lord Ganesh. During Shivaratri, many pilgrims of Mauritius walk barefoot from their homes to the lake. That's a good photo. And this is the 100-foot tall statue of Lord Shiva that's adjacent to the parking area. So once you arrive there, that's the first thing you see before you move on to the temple and then to the lake. Our youth is Shyachin Kumar Aucharaj. Sorry, Sachin, if I didn't pronounce that too well. Planter by profession identifies as a Hindu and wears a red thread, Raksha Sutra on his wrist, so others identify him as Hindu. Very Mauritian. I come from an Arya Samaj family. We don't believe in idol worship, but it's common for an Arya Samajist and Mauritius to have Hanumanji Dwaja flag at their house entrance. Arya Samaj only believes in the Vedas and the Vedic fire ceremony, Havana, but the reading of Ramayana near a dead body until it is cremated is a tradition I have seen followed in my family as well. My family performs weekly and monthly Havana at home. That's quite something, huh? weekly. We don't ordinarily go to temple, but on New Year's, Mahashivaratri, Durga Puja, and other festivals, we go to the nearest temple with the whole family. His favorite festivals are Mahashivaratri because of the strong bond that connects everyone when they go to Ganga, Talao. The second is Diwali because we go to everyone's houses to distribute sweets, which is like distributing happiness. <laughs> His favorite regular family custom is the monthly fire ceremony on Purnima, when the whole family sit together for a small fire ceremony. My father has three brothers and my grandfather had two brothers. Now everyone lives individually but in the same compound. So whenever there is any function, we are 60 or so people from the close family itself. Imagine 60 people in a compound. You have your privacy, but you are never alone. The monthly fire ceremony brings positive vibes in the house. I have nothing to dislike in my family Hindu custom, as we are free to skip the program if anything important comes. I love our culture, and the only thing I want to change in Hindu society is the superstitious mindset of people toward religion. He doesn't explain what he means. 
He is also a firm believer in Sai Baba. His motto is Sabka Malik Ek Hai, God is one. We live on a small island with many communities, so it's important to respect all religions. As a planter, I also pray to Bu Devi, Mother Earth, when I reach my fields early in the morning. So very interesting view of Hinduism from Mauritius youth. 